<laughs> All right, welcome to Hope Bible Church. Glad you're here as we get started with our Bible conference. And um, just want to start out saying that I'm very thankful. And I'm thankful to the Lord for giving us this opportunity uh, to host this conference. And I'm thankful for our church working to prepare for it. Um, a lot of organization and preparation and uh, many people involved, but especially my wife never ceases to amaze me how much she, she does and um, with joy and, and uh, it's a blessing. So um, I think uh, if the preaching flops, the food will be good. So uh, the food alone is worth the drive. But anyway, <laughs> but I'm thankful for the preachers that uh, have come, that uh, they prepared messages, they've been praying about it and and studying and uh, traveled, uh, good ways to be here. And the men that are preaching all believe the King James Bible, and they believe and preach the gospel, the grace of God, no doubt about that, very clear on it. And they rightly divide the word of truth. And uh, the, I believe they also have a good balance. Um, sometimes it's easy, it's human nature, to go to extremes, uh, but we need to balance our doctrine with our conduct you know, and not just study, but also live it out and share it with others. And so I'm thankful for uh, these men and their ministries, and I see a good balance there with them. And um, so we'll introduce those men as we go along. Um, but I'm also thankful for the uh, guests that have come in. And, you know, I know it's uh, gas is not the cheapest right now in the hotels. What in the world's going on? What do they think these rooms are, you know? We got a discounted rate, and it was still pretty high, I thought, but uh, thank you for, you know, taking the time and, and spending and, and uh, to come, and it's a, it's a blessing, you know, to meet some of you I've never met before, and so uh, to know you're watching online and to be able to meet you in person, and, you know, a lot of folks, they'll, they'll tune in on, on the live stream, and I'm thankful for that, but it's, it's better to be here in person if possible, so thank you for doing that, and um, you know, some of you haven't seen in a while, some of you have never met before, so I'm looking forward to the time of fellowship and get to know you. Uh, we have a number from out of state, um, Missouri, right, and uh, several different ones from Missouri and several from Florida. Where else? Who else is from out of state? North Carolina, North Carolina South Carolina, Alabama, <laughs> sweet home Alabama, Mississippi, West Virginia, um, so Hey, uh, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. And we got some folks that live in Georgia that traveled good ways to be here as well. So uh, I just want to say the main goals in the Bible conference, of course, always first and foremost, it's to uh, glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and glorify his holy word. And uh, we want to exalt the Lord and not diminish whatsoever from him. And we want to exalt the word of God. Never cast doubt on it whatsoever. And, and in so doing, we'll be edified in the faith. You know, as saints, we need to be built up, not in ourselves, but built up in Christ. And so people say, well, what's the theme? Well, the theme is preach the word. Very simple. <laughs> I just told the guys, hey, whatever, as you pray about it, I know I have confidence in these men, they're going to preach the Bible. So just preach the word. And I've been talking to them just out of curiosity what they're going to preach on. I think it's all going to come together. So last time, you know, we went through Titus, the whole epistle and, um, and that was kind of interesting to do that in a weekend and enjoyed that but this time it's just a, uh, whatever these men decided to preach between them and the Lord but I know it'll be a blessing and uh, we're going to enjoy the fellowship of the saints and uh, we try to have time where you know with the meals it gives us an opportunity to sit down and talk with one another and so with the, at the, I hope you'll be able to come for the breakfast and the lunch. And don't worry if you didn't on your email say you were participating. We have plenty. So just we, we ask that people let us know if they're coming just to help us get an idea so we can make sure we're prepared for it. But we have plenty of food for everybody. So I hope you'll come for the breakfast and stay for the lunch. That's tomorrow and Sunday. And, uh, and of course, we, we always want to make it clear. Uh, to the lost who may be here or who may be watching online that uh, salvation is the gift of God. Amen. And uh, it's mainly believers here, and we want to be built up in the faith, but um, always uh, emphasize the gospel, the grace of God, that we're sinners, we deserve death and hell for our sins, and there's nothing we can do to fix it. I mean, all, on our best day, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. And you don't get saved by joining the church, getting baptized, praying through, 
giving your heart to the Lord, uh, on and on and on it goes when you talk to people. Are you saved? Yeah, how do you know? And they start telling you about something they've done. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Where are you, what are you trusting in your heart? Salvation takes place when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for all of your sins, shed his pure, precious blood, and paid the price in full. And he died on the cross and, and went to the heart of the earth three days and three nights. He rose again victorious. Paul said he was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. And the only thing you need to do to be saved is just trust the Lord. Uh, that you can't do it and quit trying to get saved. Just trust him and he'll save you by grace. It's a free gift. And we want to make that crystal clear. I don't ever take it for granted everybody in the room saved. I don't know your heart, only God does. But we want to make that real clear. So before we go any further, I'm going to give some announcements, but I want to just start with a word of prayer uh, before we go any further and ask the Lord to just bless our time together uh, during this Bible conference. And without Him or nothing, and really true prayer is an expression of dependence on God. Uh, I was thinking about it before I came out of the office a minute ago and been praying and studying, and, and, uh, and I, I tell the Lord, it doesn't matter how much I prepare and what I have, if you don't use it, it's just going to be just worthless. So the Spirit of God, I trust, will use His Word. But we need to depend on Him in sincerity. I don't want to just go through the motions. I want the Lord to use these messages uh, in a great way. So let's stop and have a word of prayer before we go any further. And uh, I'm going to ask Brother Bloodworth, if you don't mind, sir, to open us in prayer, please.
Let's go to Proverbs chapter 23. You're stuck with me first. <laughs> For various reasons, I'm not going to explain it all, but I'm going to get out of the way here. Proverbs chapter number 23 is where we'll start. And I, I would tell you how many cross-references, but uh, you might get a little nervous if I told you. <laughs> but the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible, and the Bible interprets itself as you compare spiritual things with spiritual and so we'll start in Proverbs 23, and uh, just a moment here. Uh, the book of Proverbs, of course, is a collection of wise sayings that are inspired of God. And uh, the word proverb comes from two Latin words, pro, meaning instead of, and verba, words. So a proverb is wisdom packed into a short saying instead of many words. And uh, they say that the brevity is the soul of wit. And it's amazing to me how God can say so much in so few words. And I hadn't figured that out myself yet. <laughs> but it's a, it really is amazing. I'm going through Ephesians right now on Sunday morning and uh, just six chapters. But you could spend the rest of your life in Ephesians. There's so much there to meditate on. But, um, you know, it's written to Israel uh, under the dispensation of law. We understand that. But there are moral principles in Proverbs that still apply to the body of Christ under grace. And what we're going to look at tonight is a principle that certainly applies. And we're going to look at Proverbs 23, verse 23, where it says, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. There's so much wisdom packed into that verse that I'm going to preach two messages on it. Okay, Tonight's going to be an introduction, and then I'm going to give the message on Sunday. <laughs> okay. But that's, uh, I said, well, if I'm going to do two messages, then I'm going to just, what, you know, I never finish one. I never finish a message. So I'm going to I'm going to pick one message and, and then preach twice and try to get it all in. I probably still won't get it all in, but uh, it's, uh, I'm not going to exhaust it. I'll do two messages on it, and there's still more to say. But if you look at the first part of the verse, there's just seven words, and they're one-syllable words. Now, there are deep things of God in the Scripture, but there are also simple things that God wants everybody to get when they're starting out just as babes, the milk of the Word. And here He gives you a principle that's so simple. Buy the truth and sell it not. How many ways can you interpret that? I mean, you know, people say, well, that's just your interpretation. There's only so many ways you can interpret that statement. It's very to the point. It's very plain. It's very direct. And yet, it's so deep. I mean, it conveys a life-changing principle if you'll take, uh, take it to heart and follow it. Those who are wise seek to personally possess the truth at any cost. And then they'll never part with it for any cause. Get the truth, no matter what it costs, and once you have it, don't ever sell it out. And right along with God's truth, we're going to need, he said, wisdom and instruction and understanding. And you see, emphasized in Proverbs, those three things, knowledge, instruction is the instruction and knowledge. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and you see that emphasized in the Word of God. Uh, for example, uh, to, to put it simply, instruction has to do with gaining knowledge of the truth. But we need understanding. That's when you start comprehending the truth where, you know, you see it and you get it and it sticks with you. And then the wisdom is putting it into use, the proper use. Uh, there are some people that are so smart, I mean, they have a lot of book learning, but uh, they couldn't walk through the forest without bumping into the trees. They don't, I mean, they lack in practical wisdom. You need both. You need, you need the knowledge of what God's Word says, but you need to know how to put it in proper use. Now, for example, in Colossians 1, and we'll use the screen to save some time. Flip if you can keep up. <laughs> but, but like I say, we're going to look at a lot of cross-references. Colossians 1, verse 9, in this age of grace, we need this knowledge and understanding and wisdom. You see, Paul, as he prays for the saints, he says in Colossians 1, 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, uh, do not cease to pray for you, come out heard of their faith in Christ, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will. And you got believers running around trying to find the will of God. Well, if God hid it, you wouldn't be able to find it. <laughs> he didn't hide it, He revealed it. And He revealed it in His Word, and He wants you to be filled with the knowledge of it. 
And it doesn't come through circumstance and feelings and, and a lot of superstitious stuff people uh, think about along these lines. It comes through knowing the Word of God. He's revealed His will in His Word. And this is talking about the big picture of what He's doing in this age and understanding where we're living in God's uh, plan for the ages, having a knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Well, what's the result of that? If you get that knowledge of His will and you understand it by the Holy Spirit and you have wisdom concerning it, what that'll do is this, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power and all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. And so you see the importance of it. Now, I'd like to preach on that text. There's a lot there to consider, but I'm just pointing out to you the importance of having this knowledge and understanding and wisdom. And that goes along with the truth of God's Word. So back to this thing of buying the truth. You know, there's a big difference between just mentally assenting to truth that you've heard from others and buying it for yourself. Look in the context of Proverbs 23. Back up, I'd like to read half the chapter, but for time's sake we won't do that. But just back up to verse 22. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she's old. Now, if you got godly parents, you should be very thankful. And if they're telling you about the Lord and His Word, you better listen to that. But it's not enough. God doesn't have any grandchildren, you understand. you got to be born of God's Spirit personally. You're not saved because your parents are. You're not right with God because your parents are. You, you know, you need to listen to them if they're telling you the things of God but he said, buy the truth and sell it not. In other words, I, I'm, hearken to me, I'm telling you. But you personally, you need to buy the truth for yourself. And I tell my kids that all the time. I say, you're being brought up in the Word of God. And don't take that for granted. Because a lot of kids aren't, sadly. But you've got to personally believe it. And read that Bible and study that Bible, and you can't just take my word for it. Always check it with the Scripture. I'm trying to preach the truth, but I'm not infallible. Only the Bible's infallible. And so I encourage them, and thank God they do. They get in the Word of God, and you've got to know it personally. And then he said, verse 24, The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. If, if your children will buy the truth for themselves, they'll become righteous and wise. And what great joy there is in that. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. My son, now this is a key verse on parenting. Give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Uh, if, if you can have your children's respect, and you can live a right example before them and not be hypocritical, that'll go a long way in them turning out right. And I, I believe the first ministry is in the home. A man that, um, I mean, you look in 1 Timothy 3, it's very clear. You've got to take care of your own house if you're going to be able to take care of the church of God. And it starts in, in the home. When Paul talked about being filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 5, what did he talk about? Right after saying be filled with the Spirit, he talked about husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Uh, children, obey your parents. Fathers, bring your children up. Uh, and we do that by depending on the Spirit of God to enable us. And true spirituality, where it's going to show up first, is in the home, and if it's not there, it's not real. And that's why a lot of people, they can grow up hearing some truth, and then they leave the church as, as they, uh, they make their own choice. They haven't bought it for themselves, and they depart from it. That's a sad thing indeed. But no, personally, you got to personally buy the truth. To buy the truth means it is dwelling deep within our heart so that it forms who we are. Okay? You know, to buy the truth, what it means is to be fully persuaded. To be fully persuaded that what God said is truth. And the attitude is like what Paul said, let God be true and every man a liar. God is true. He speaks the truth. And if your views are different from His, your views are wrong. And if you claim they're right, then you're a liar. Because God is true, right? That's the attitude we need to have. It is to have a real conviction about what you believe. Many who hear the truth, they hear it, but they won't pay the price 
to be able to say for themselves, this is what I believe, this is what I stand for. The truth just isn't worth that much to them because they don't sincerely believe it. There's a difference between hearing it and believing it. It starts with hearing but you need to receive it personally and believe it with all your heart and buy the truth. And we're going to talk in this message and next about what that means to, to buy the truth, what it may cost you, but whatever it costs is well worth it. Amen. Nothing more valuable than the truth. But you know, many in our society today, just like Pilate of old, they're very cynical about the truth. You remember what Pilate said to Jesus Christ in John 18? Uh, whenever the Lord was standing before him, Pilate, in verse 37, Therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I in the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all, he knew he was an innocent man, but it, he, he was in a real situation here. I'm not going to get into, but he, was a, he, he, he really messed up. Let's just make it that simple. But he's looking at the truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the truth. And everything he said was true. And he's talking to him, and Pilate said, what is true? And he said it cynically because he didn't wait for an answer. He just turned around and walked off. And there's a lot of people that have that attitude. Now, I thank God there's still some people who want the truth, but not everybody does. Uh, uh, the Bible said in John 3 that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And not everybody wants the truth. That's a choice people make. But I'm going to say that despite popular opinion, there is such a thing in 2023, there is such a thing as the truth. The truth. Okay? Buy the truth. Well, the truth must be available. How can I buy it if it's not there? So we just start that simple, okay? Uh, first of all, it is divine. The truth is available and it is divine, meaning God is the source of truth. Now, we can give you uh, several verses on this. In the Godhead, Deuteronomy 32, 4, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. Jesus saith unto him in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in John 16, 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, and he's called that several times. See, there's one God in three persons. The true and living God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal, not three gods, one God in three persons. You say, explain it. Why do I have to explain it? God is beyond our comprehension. He's Almighty God. But we believe what the Bible said. These three are one, it says in 1 John 5, 7, and other verses we can look at. But the Spirit of truth, when He's come, what is He going to do? He'll guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. And, I, and you can just mark it down. The people talking the most about the Holy Ghost seem to know the least about him. He doesn't come to glorify himself, although he's co-equal with the Father and the Son. But what does he come to do? To glorify the Son. That's how that works. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. But I'm just pointing out that the Father is the truth, the Son is the truth, and the Spirit is the truth. Okay? It's divine. It doesn't come from man. The truth comes from God. It is absolute. The truth is absolute. And there's many verses on that, but Psalm 119, 160 said, Thy word is true from the beginning, and how, how long will it remain? So every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. From the beginning and forever, it is the truth. Titus 1, 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God cannot lie. Everything he Look, if He is the truth, everything He says is the truth. He can't be wrong. If He was ever wrong, He wouldn't be God. He is, it is absolute. It's not relative. People say, well, that's your truth. This is my truth. No such thing as your truth and my truth. It's God's truth. It's not relative to the, the society and the circumstance and and people want to always want to adapt things and say, well, that might have been wrong back then, but it's not wrong now. Moral truth never changes. 
Now, there is dispensational truth, and we'll get to that eventually in this message, where God will make some changes in how he's dealing with man as he progressively reveals more things. But as far as the moral truth of God, it runs like a straight line from Genesis to Revelation. And it, back there in the beginning, whenever he created them, he created them male and female. And so the truth is there's two genders. That's the truth. Someone says there's more than two. You're a liar. You're a liar and a psycho on top of that. You're a psychopathic liar. Don't, hey, people are starting to water down on this stuff and they're starting to cave to the pressure. If you love people, you got to tell them the truth. This stuff is destroying people. Don't back off. Tell them the truth in love, but tell them the truth. Marriage, someone said there's, there's same-sex marriage. That's a lie. There's no such thing as same-sex marriage. Marriage is a man and a woman, right? The Bible's very clear on that. And so same-sex marriage, that's not a marriage. That's an abomination. That's a perversion. That's a lie. All right? Uh, we didn't evolve. We were created by God. Someone says, no, we evolved. You're a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. God's word is truth, and it's absolute. Two plus two still equals five. I'm just saying if you're listening. It equals, someone says, I feel like it equals, it doesn't matter how you feel about it because, because truth is not objective, okay? Or excuse me, subjective, it's objective. It, it's not based on how you feel or what your opinions are. Absolute truth. It's authoritative. The truth is authoritative. Of course, many verses on that, but Jesus in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, when he was given the constitution, the kingdom of heaven, when he finished up, it says in Matthew 7, 28, it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them. And doctrine is teaching. And then you got churches today saying, well, we're, we're not really into doctrine. So that means you're not teaching anything. They're into philosophy and, and, and uh, you know, game time and programs, but... We need to be about doctrine. In the pastoral epistles, Paul talks about doctrine 16 times, quite the emphasis. Uh, and so the doctrine is, is the Bible teaching, for he taught them with apology. No, he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Why is it if you get up and really believe what you're saying and you speak authoritative, people call you arrogant, they call you cocky and all that? Jesus Christ gave the truth, and you know what? I still have his truth in the, preserved in this book. This book right here is the Word of God, so if I get up and I have the Word of God, I ought to speak it with authority. That's not, that's not being arrogant. That's being humble. I'm saying this is the Word of God. This is where the authority is. I mean, if I didn't believe this was the truth, I wouldn't be wasting my time up here. But Paul told Titus in Titus 2.15, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee, implying there are going to be people who do. When you preach like he told them in Titus 2, which he pretty much told everybody how to live in that chapter. I mean, you read that chapter and you get home tonight and see. And so, but it's authoritative. And then it's objective. The truth is objective, meaning it's not subject. By the way, authoritative, I'll just say, this is a whole, you can do a whole series just on these points. You understand, there's a lot here to think about. But authoritative means it's not up for debate. It's not up for discussion. I mean, thus saith the Lord, period. Someone said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. <laughs> no, it, it was settled long before you showed up. The Word of God settled forever in heaven. God said it, and that settles it. And you'd, be, you'd be wise to believe it. But whether you believe it or not doesn't make any difference as far as the, the authority of God's Word. And it's objective, meaning it's not subjective. It's not subject to our feelings and our thoughts. And again, I give you Romans 3. What if some did not believe? Romans 3, 3. Shall their uh, unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, mightest overcome when thou art judged. And there's a lot of people trying to judge God, but look, look, he's the judge, and his word is the truth. And one last thing about it, it's eternal. The truth is divine. It is absolute. It is authoritative. It is objective and it is eternal. I'm going to give you all of Psalm 117. I'm going to read the whole psalm. You ready? It's two verses. All right. Psalm 117. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise Him, all ye people. For His merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. <laughs> Matthew 24, 35, one of my favorite verses when Jesus Christ said, Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words... 
Now, by the way, words, plural. Not just the thoughts or the doctrine, as long as it's close, that kind of, no, it's the words. The words shall not pass away. And so we still have the words of God preserved for us today. In English, it's in the King James Bible, and there's no doubt about that. It stood the test of time, proving itself for over 400 years to be the pure word of God. But God has revealed His truth to man. God is truth. He's revealed His truth to man, and He put it down in writing, and He said, search the Scriptures. It's right there. It's available to you. I love, I love Psalm 33, 4, where it said, the word of the Lord is right. You say, what's it right about? Everything it says. The word of the Lord is right, and all His works are done in truth. And 1 Thessalonians, I told you there's a lot of verses. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, for this cause, and by the way, if you just do a study on this, it's amazing all the things you, I looked up and read every verse on truth, there's 230 something references to truth in the, in the King James Bible, and there's, I'm not giving you all 235, but there's, there, there's a lot in there. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, for this cause uh, also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, what you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men. But as it is in truth, the Word of God. And when you really believe that, notice, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Effectually, it's going to accomplish the desired effect. It's going to make a difference when you believe it. It's in you when you receive it as the Word of God which is why I don't tolerate people casting doubt on the Word of God to any degree. To any degree. And, you, and it always starts real slight, you know. Just a little question mark about it. And you better just nip it in the bud right there. I told a guy not long ago, he started saying some things. I was like, you know what? I said, this is where we're parting ways. Because, see, I, you, may say, you may say I have good intentions and all that, but there's something in that, what you're saying right there, just don't sit with me and, and my conviction about this King James Bible. And you've got to be ultra careful with that. Because this, I mean, everything we believe is based on what this book says. And that is the fundamental of fundamentals. Which is why I'm more than a fundamentalist. I not only believe the fundamentals, I believe the words of God. Being a Bible believer, taking the words of God and knowing this is, the, every word of God is pure. He's a shield to them that trust in Him. Proverbs 30. So when you really believe that and you trust in His Word, that's the shield of faith. You better, you better have that in this evil day and the spiritual warfare that we're in. Uh, and so God, God gave us His Word. And, and Daniel 10, 21, it talked about the Scripture of truth. It's noted in the Scripture of truth. In John 17, the Son praying to the Father said, Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. He didn't just say it, it is true, which is, which is a true statement. But no, more than that, it is truth, meaning it's the standard. It's the authority. And 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All right, every word of it. And it's profitable for doctrine, proof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. And, you know, God gave His words. And he not only gave them, he has preserved them so that they're still pure today. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. In Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7. And so uh, that's the pure words of God that we have today, and they are found in English in the King James Bible. That's the preserved word of God. That's the standard today. God used Hebrew, God used Greek, and he's using English the same way. See, I believe the King James Bible is given by inspiration of God. The first, the first time it occurs, inspirationally, is found twice. The first is the first book ever written, Job. It says, the inspiration of the Almighty gave them understanding. The spirit of man, the inspiration of the Almighty gave them understanding. And those translators were brilliant men, but there's no way they could have produced this book in their own mind. The Spirit of God gave them understanding so that these are living words. These are spiritual words. And I wouldn't change one thing, not the italicized words, not a comma. I, I even believe this concordance is perfect in the back of my Bible. I mean, every single thing about it is that's hyperbole. It'd be all right. But I'm just saying, I don't think I'm going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord's going to say, why did you believe my word so much? You should have had some more doubt about it. 
I think I'm on safe ground believing the Word of God, okay? And I take the King James Bible by a faith position. I, I don't need all these dry lectures about what the, I don't care what the translators thought. They weren't even right on a lot of things about their doctrine. They weren't dispensational, but they produced a dispensational masterpiece. How do you figure that out? The Spirit of God did it through them. And so my, my thing, I, I give God the glory. What I'm saying is I don't mind looking at history, and I've read the material and looked at it, but at the end of the day, this book proves itself, and you either believe God gave you his words or you don't. It's a faith position. You can argue all day, every day about manuscript evidence and the history, and it's an unending snooze fest type of stuff. I'm just sick of it. You either believe it or you don't. I believe it. Praise the Lord. Look in Proverbs 22, if you would. Proverbs 22. You see, it's called the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth, right? 2 Timothy 2.15. Hey, uh, <clears throat> you better make sure you have the word of truth or you're not going to be able to rightly divide it very well. Because only the King James Bible says that, by the way, in 2 Timothy 2.15. gives you that key. The modern versions mess it all up. But you've got to start with the word of truth. And I can fellowship with a man that believes the word of God, even though he may not agree with me on everything dispensationally, if he's a Bible believer, we got a good starting point. I can fellowship more with a Bible believer who's not as dispensational as I am than I can with somebody who agrees more with me on dispensationalism but doesn't believe the King James Bible. Amen. <laughs> because the Word of God is most important. That's, that's where we start. And it's called the Word of Truth five times. It's called words of truth four times. That makes nine times the number of fruitfulness. And in Proverbs 22, verse number 17, the Scripture says, Bow down thine ear, and hear the words of the wise, and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. For it's a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. They shall withal be fit in thy lips. In other words, what you believe, you'll talk about. That Now, here's why you need to, to, to learn the truth and have the truth. This is what it's about. Two reasons he gives. That thy trust may be in the Lord. How do you trust a God you don't know? How do you trust him when you don't know what he said? That thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. Have I not written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. So I want to know this book so I can trust the Lord and then I'll be able to help somebody else. Because this book has all the answers we need. And when people are saying, hey, what's the answer to this? Or what's the answer to that? I don't have the answers, but I know where they're found. And I can, I can take you to the book and show you in the book. And this book is still the truth, and it's exactly what we need. And so the Bible's not everything God knows. You couldn't put all that in one book. He's infinite. But it's everything we need to know. It's everything He wants us to know. And this book reveals the absolute truth about God, about the devil, about man, about his fall, about sin, about salvation, about damnation, about eternity, and on and on. Everything that we need to know, we must know. The truth of it is in this book. Now, buy the truth and sell it not. The purpose of selling something is to make a profit. Isn't that kind of the idea? Well, if you sold out the truth of God's Word for all the money in the world, however much that would be, you would take a big loss. <laughs> you would not make a profit. Because this, the truth of this book is worth more than anything this world has. You know, the, the, one of the richest men who ever lived was Solomon. He got away from God, and he, and he wrote about the vanity of life under the sun without the Lord. And he, had, he was the richest man on the earth, and he had anything and everything he wanted. And uh, you know about King Solomon. You know what he said when he was in that state, when he got gotten away from the Lord? He said in Ecclesiastes 2.17, I hated life. Some of the most miserable people in the world have the most stuff. Money can't buy you salvation, it can't buy you peace, it can't buy you joy, it can't buy you things that matter. And so if you had all the money in the world and you didn't have the truth of God, look, this book is worth more than we can ever even fathom putting a value on. In Proverbs 23, it says in verse number 4, Proverbs 23 and verse number 4, it says, Labor not to be rich. In other words, there's nothing wrong with having riches, but if you love riches, you're covetous, and the love of money is the root of all evil, Paul warned in 1 Timothy 6. Money's not evil, it's the love of it, it's the problem. If your whole purpose in life is to get a bunch of stuff and store it away, what a, what a vain life to live. 
Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. By the way, buy the truth. That's something it'll cost. It'll cost you your own wisdom, but it's good to get rid of it because it ain't much. <laughs> get God's wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Job was a wealthy man. He lost it all in one day. One day. Folks, you know we're living volatile times. I don't want to be Debbie Downer here, but uh, uh, you realize who, who they got up there in Washington? To, and what's going? Do you, it's bad, okay? Uh, I mean, we're just on the verge of some major things happening anyway. I don't want to discourage you. But if your trust is not in your riches, then you're all right. Put your trust in God, okay? I mean, that imposter that's up there, that who, they put him in there, and whoever's telling him what to do, I mean, they're all crooked as they... I mean, they're so crooked, the devil is nauseated by their crookedness. <laughs> and uh, so this, uh, this, uh, this thing going on in our country, man, it's real bad. So I try not to focus on that. I can't, I can't fix it. I can't do anything about it. And neither can any other man trust in God. Look to God. Look to God. And uh, there's nothing more valuable than the Word of God. Now I was going to, I'm looking at the clock and I'm looking at, I had a lot of reference. I'm going to give you this one, Job 28, just to give you, not, there's, you understand there's many more we can give along these same lines, but this is a powerful passage about this, about buying the truth. Job 28. And um, man, if you, you host a conference and you have a schedule and you mess up the schedule when you're the first one, that's pretty bad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Job 28 verse 12 But where shall wisdom be found And where is the place of understanding Man knoweth not the price thereof Neither is it found in the land of the living The depth saith it's not in me The sea saith it's not with me It cannot be gotten for gold Neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir With the precious onyx or the sapphire, the gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia uh, shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. Whence then cometh wisdom? And where is the place of understanding, seeing it's hid from the eyes of all living and kept close from the fowls of the air? Destruction and death say, we've heard the fame thereof with our ears. God understandeth the way thereof, and he knoweth the place thereof. For he looketh to the ends of the earth, and seeth unto the whole heaven, to make the weight for the winds, and he weigheth the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain, and a way for the lightning of the thunder. Then did he see it, declare it, he prepared it, yea, and searched it out. And unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. It's got to come from God. Okay, and you can go through, I'm going to give you a couple more in Psalm 19, where it says, you're familiar, Psalm 19.10, uh, where uh, Paulo was singing that, that great hymn out of uh, that psalm there, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. And Psalm 119.72, The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. And 127, Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yeah, above fine gold. And on, look, you, I could stand up here for a long time giving you references where the Word of God's telling you there's nothing more valuable than the truth of God, the wisdom of God. In a world full of lies, the truth is worth far more than anything you can give in exchange for it. Anything it may cost us to buy the truth is well worth it. Because when you get the truth, when you know and believe the truth, you know what that brings? I'll give you a couple examples. That'll bring, first of all, assurance of salvation. When you, when you know and believe the truth of the Word of God, you can know you're saved. That's pretty good, isn't it? In Ephesians 1.13, Paul said, In whom, to about the Lord Jesus Christ, you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. What is the gospel of your salvation? The word of truth in this age of grace by which we're saved is the good news that Paul declares in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. It's how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's it. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ plus nothing. Minus nothing, 
It's the finished work of Jesus Christ that when you hear the, the word of truth, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. When, that, when you believe the gospel that though you're a sinner worthy of damnation, you deserve death and hell for your sins, but you believe Jesus died for you and paid for your sins in full and He was buried and rose again the third day when you trust, not just mentally assent, but depend on Him, trusting in your heart that He died for you. You can know Jesus died on the cross. You've got to trust He died for you because of your sins. Not just a mental historical fact. It's believing in your heart it was for you He died. And it's personal and you believe on Him. Then you're saved and sealed with the Holy Spirit. And Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. For you know, as you know what manner men we were among you for your sake, He wants you to have much assurance. To know that you're saved and that you can never lose it. You can know it because God cannot lie and God cannot fail. My salvation depends on Him and not me. If it was based on me, I couldn't get it to start with, and if somehow I did, I'd lose it in two seconds. It's based totally on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it glorifies Him to have assurance of salvation because you know He's not a liar. You know He's not a failure. I'm a member of His body. A member of His body is not going into hell. It's settled. It's done. And I know it. I have the truth about my salvation. The assurance of salvation doesn't come by how you feel. It doesn't come by how you live. It doesn't come by anything you are or anything you do. It comes by believing what God said. And that's what faith is, believing what God said. And so it'll bring real and lasting freedom. When you know the truth, when you believe the truth, the Lord Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. In John 8, 32, and then he said, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. That tells you the Son is the truth. You shall be free indeed. And, hey, look, when you get saved, you have freedom in Christ, but it's possible as a believer to get under some bondage of false doctrine. So Paul wrote to some believers. Uh, he wrote about the, the danger of false doctrine in 2 Timothy 2, and he said in verse 25, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the what? Acknowledging of the truth. You don't have to be under the bondage of religion and false doctrine if you will acknowledge God's truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now, the devil can't take away your salvation, but if you give place to your flesh, you give place to the devil, and he can ensnare you. But you can recover yourself. I tell people, see, I'm not much of a, a, a great counselor, you know, because I don't think it's up to me to recover anybody. I say, I'll tell you the truth, and you can recover yourself if you repent and believe it. It's personal. You can't believe it for them. You can't obey it for them. But you've got to tell them the truth. And you can have real and lasting freedom. And you can have the knowledge of God. The truth brings the knowledge of God, not just knowing things about Him, but knowing Him in a real relationship. Where in 1 John 5, 20, John said, We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Knowing Him that is true. Nothing more important than that. Sanctification comes. Sanctification by the truth. That's why Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And Paul said in Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water. How? By the word. God will save you as you are. He will not leave you as you are. You're justified by faith alone. Believing on Christ, you're justified by His righteousness. And you are sanctified as a member of His body, baptized by one spirit and one body. You're set apart in Him. But He wants that sanctification to be lived out in your walk. And He wants to clean you up through the water of His Word, by the truth. And on it goes. You see, this is a big subject to talk about, right? I'm just trying to show you how important it is and how valuable it is. You see, salvation is a free gift. But it's going to cost you something to come into the knowledge of the truth. Paul said, God will have all men to be saved and Come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's the will of God. You get saved as a free gift because Christ paid it all. But if you're going to come unto the knowledge of the truth, it's going to cost. And you can, 
You cannot buy. You cannot buy the truth with money. Now you can go buy a Bible with money. There's a lot of people that own a Bible that don't know what it says. You can buy a Bible with money, but you can't buy what it costs to learn the truth of the Bible with money. I'll tell you what it'll cost. Look in Proverbs 2. Proverbs chapter 2, if you would, please. Proverbs chapter number 2. Here, and I'm going to say more about this in the next message, but I'm going to give you some specific things it may cost you. You know, kind of like uh, your reputation, <laughs> some relationships, uh, your self-righteousness, your traditions. There's a lot of things it'll cost you, but that, you don't need any of that anyway. All you need is the Lord. That's what you need. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if thou wilt, and he's going to give seven things here. Number one, receive my words. And number two, hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord. And find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. There's those three things again. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He's a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment. And preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Yea, every good path. Now that takes some effort. That takes some time. That takes some dedication. It doesn't happen on accident. It doesn't happen by osmosis. You don't go through the drive through and say, I'd like a Bible education, please, and give it to me right now. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's a work, but it's so worth it. Because as you begin to learn more and more of God's truth, you get more excited, you enjoy it more, and you want to keep learning, and you'll never learn it all in this life. I feel sorry for these Christians who think they got it all figured out. They know a few things, and they think they got it wrapped up on the Bible. I mean, it's just unending. It's, this is an infinite book written by an infinite God. I mean, the, 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 you can just dig and dig and dig. And look, if someone said, look, I'm going to give you a, 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 a map that is very difficult to follow, but if you follow it and you figure it out, it'll lead you to $10 million. All of a sudden, you'll have all kind of time to to figure it out and to work at it, make sure because, you know, you're really interested in that money, right? I don't have time to study the Bible. Yeah, you do. You just don't use your time wisely. All right? You, put, you know, where's your priorities? I mean, you know, you can make time for what matters to you. You've got the time. Redeem the time, we're told. That's what's most important. And, and if, you, if you really believe, if someone said, I'll pay you $10,000 a day if you spend an hour in that book, all of a sudden you'll have an hour to spend every day. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, you'll have that, right? But I'm telling you, no, the money is nothing. What you get out of learning this book, the truth of the Word of God, it's worth the effort. It's worth the dedication. And look, I'm saying you've got to put the work in, but you've got to depend on God because the, the Spirit of God who wrote this book has to enlighten your understanding to it. So don't depend on you, depend on him. But you got to give him something to work with. You got to get in the book. He's not going to drop it in your head magically. God, give me a knowledge of your word. He said, I gave you my book. Open it, read it, study it. And then you're giving him something he can work with right there. Now, the truth costs more than just time and effort. We're going to talk about that in the next message. It costs, there's various things it could cost you. And it's going to cost. And if you, don't, if you don't think so, just believe it with all your heart. Live by it. Preach it. Defend it. Stand for it. And you're going to start finding out you're, it's going to cost you something. And for many of our Christian forefathers, it even cost them their life. We forget about that because we've been so stinking spoiled. But that's changing. That's changing. We're living in such volatile times. We can wake up tomorrow. We're already in communism. So it's coming. It's done. Been here. Where have you been? I mean, wake up, folks. This isn't the America I was born into. I mean, this it's changing so quickly you can't keep up with it. And I'm telling you, persecution's coming. And I think we need it. I don't want to volunteer for it. <laughs> 
but the, it, the, it'll wake up the real believers and, and maybe we'll get serious about what we're here to do as ambassadors for Christ. I'm not here to make America great again. I'm here to get sinners saved out of hell. I'm here to teach people the word of God. Now, I'm going to take a stand. Look, you know, I still vote if it matters. I'm not sure anymore. But you do what you can do, and you pray, and you, and you take a stand. But my confidence, my trust is, is in the Lord and what he left me here to do. My conversation is in heaven. And I'm looking for the Savior to come any moment. And I want to redeem the time and, and spend my life in his truth to make the difference because the truth is what makes people free. But I'm going to finish tonight just giving you a little illustration here about one out of many examples uh, about, when you think about the price, see, when you don't pay a price, you tend to take it for granted. Amen. Just like even in America, all right? Now, I admit, I take, I didn't pay a price for my freedom. So, I, you know, being just a human being, I tend to take my freedom for granted. I should. So sometimes I'll try to, I'll go in there and read history and try to learn about what our forefathers paid for. And it's so sad, though, when you see what they gave us and what we got now. It's so vastly different. But, but when you pay a price for something, you, I mean, it means something to you. You know what I mean? And just like this book, I mean, I like the Constitution, but I like the King James Bible a lot better. And when I think about what it cost, I mean, I give God all the glory for the King James Bible. I've already said that. I'm going to say it again. I mean, he preserved his words. But I am thankful for the men he used. There are men that paid the ultimate price to make his word available to us, to the common man. And God used William Tyndale in a great way. You know, he, he was um, working on translating and publishing the Bible in English many years ago in the 1500s. He was forbidden to work in England. He translated and printed the New Testament, half the Old Testament, between 1525 and 1535 in Germany and in the Low Countries. And, you know, much of his work is still in this King James Bible. Much of Tyndale's work is in this King James Bible. God used him in a great way. Here's some things Tyndale said. He said, I perceived how that it was impossible to establish the lay people in any truth except the Scripture were plainly laid before their eyes and their mother tongue. See, the, 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 the Roman church don't want the people to have the word of God. Because if they did and they read it, they realize most everything they're doing is not in there. <laughs> they got it from paganism. And uh, the, well, the audacity they have, though, they, they talk about being the mother church and how they gave us the Bible. I remember one guy I was trying to witness to him. He said, oh, I'm a member of the mother church. I said, oh, yeah, what church is that? He said, the the Catholic, and this was when I was young, and I didn't have a lot of, you know, I was a little bit more zealous than knowledgeable and probably shouldn't have said that. I said, oh, yeah, that's the mother church, the mother whore. <laughs> he didn't like that too much, but it's true, but maybe I should have used a little different approach. <laughs> and then another guy one time I was talking to him, he said, we, Catholic Church gave you the Bible, so the only thing y'all gave us is a hard time. <laughs> you didn't give us no Bible. This Bible is not, the Catholic has, Church has a Bible. It's not this King James Bible. There's a big difference there. But he said, I, he said, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I'll cause a boy who drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. He said, I call God to record against the day we shall all appear before our Lord Jesus that I never altered one syllable of God's word against my conscience. Nor would do this day if all that is in earth, whether it be honor, pleasure, or riches, might be given me. He bought the truth. And he didn't sell it out. You see, his pocket-sized Bible translations were smuggled into England and then they were ruthlessly sought out by the Catholic Church. They were confiscated, destroyed. And eventually Tyndale was uh, betrayed by a friend, a so-called friend named Phillips. He was arrested. He was imprisoned for over 500 days in horrible conditions. He wrote, Tyndale wrote when he was in prison, My overcoat is worn out, my shirts are also worn out, and I ask to be allowed to have a lamp in the evening. It is indeed wearisome sitting alone in the dark. And what was his crime? Well, in 1536, he was tried for heresy and treason. And a ridiculously unfair trial, of course. He was convicted, and here's, I'm not going to give you all of them, but here's some of his heresies. Here's some of his heresies. 
Number one, he maintains that faith alone justifies. He denies there is any purgatory. He affirms that neither the virgin nor the saints pray for us in their own person. He asserts that neither the virgin nor the saints should be invoked by us. See, Tyndale was right and the church was wrong. They, they, that's, that's, they preach a false gospel, they're full of false doctrine. Tyndale took a stand because he knew the truth. He bought the truth. And when they persecuted him for it, he didn't recant. He did not. He, 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 look, he didn't sell it out. He didn't sell it out. After 11 months of privation and starvation, he was brought out of prison and tied to the center post in the castle courtyard. And he was given the choice of kindness because he was a clergyman. They said, for the clergyman, we give you a kindness. You know what that kindness was? It meant the executioner would strangle him with a cord before lighting him on fire. That was the kindness. And Tyndale opted for the kindness and said his last word, you know, you probably heard it, oh God, open the eyes of the king of England. And they strangle him and they burn him. He was 42 years old. I mean, that really hits me. I'm... 43 years old. I'm thinking, try to think back what that must have been like and what he was going through. And man, I have great respect for people like that. Did Tyndale know the revelation, the mystery? I don't know. Maybe not, but God used him to what he did know. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you what, you got to start with believing the book. and You better start there. See, what's going to happen? I'm going to get to the right division stuff in the next message, but the reason why I preach this first because if you're not a real Bible believer, and it won't be long. See, that right division goes hand in hand with being a Bible believer. So if you try to do the right division without believing the book, it won't be long. You'll be out of the right division also. You understand? And so it, it goes together. You start with believing the book, and then if you believe it, you ought to study it the way God told you. So it's not enough just to believe you have the truth. Now you need to, now that you know you got it, you need to study it the way He told you, and you can begin to understand it. Because although the moral truth of God never changes, there is such a thing as dispensational truth. And there are things that were true for Israel under the law that are no longer true for the body of Christ under grace. And you better, so you, you start being a real Bible believer, but then you come along and you begin to cultivate that understanding of, of rightly dividing the word of truth. And as you do that, if you are a Bible believer that rightly divides the word of truth, expect some problems, <laughs> expect some opposition, because that means you're on the right track and that's where you're going to meet the devil. All right? But buy the truth and sell it not. It's worth it. It's worth it. No matter what the price is, it's more than worth it. And again, we depend on God. Without Him, we're nothing. We depend on Him. But He gives us His truth. He teaches us His truth. And what I want to do next time in the follow-up message is, so we kind of laid a foundation, but when we know we have the book and we have God's truth, now we, as we rightly divide the word of truth, there's some things that come along with that. There's some things that come along with that. And we need to, and I'm telling you, we're in the last days that Paul spoke of in 2 Timothy 3, and we're seeing people departing from the truth. I, I, there are men I knew, knew personally that at one time believed the King James Bible and believed right in right division that no longer believe either. That's a real danger. It's, and, and don't, if you sit here and say, well, that's not me, it could, then you're probably next because you're overconfident. You need to wake up and realize we're in this battle, and you've got you to put all your confidence in the Lord and realize there's some things here about buying the truth and selling it. Now, I really believe that's a proverb we need now more than ever in the days we're living in. Because I, I fear there are people that know some things they haven't really bought it. And that's why you're seeing them sell it out like they are. And so that's what we want to develop in the next message. But I'm going to stop there. Let's uh, stand, if you would, please. And what we're going to do now is I'm going to pray, and after I pray, Brother uh, Stephen is going to come up and lead us in a hymn, and that'll be your opportunity if you need to slip out. Uh, the bathrooms are in the foyer, so the men's room is closer to the front door, the ladies' room is closer to the side door, and then we got some outhouses. If you go out the side door to the right, uh, they call them porta potties, but they're basically outhouses. Now, the reason why we got those is because, I mean, we got small bathrooms trying to alleviate that. So if you don't mind using the outhouse, use it. Use it, all right? Paid good money for those cotton picking things. <laughs> so we just, uh, 
slip out because we're not, we only have two messages tonight, and so I, we're not going to take a long break. We're going to sing, and then you can use the restroom if you don't mind. Now, we'll take longer breaks tomorrow when we have more preaching, but uh, let's pray, and then we'll sing, and then we'll have the second message, all right? Father, we're thankful tonight for the Word of God. I, Lord, we looked at a lot of Scripture, and there's so much more to look at on this thing of the truth that you've given us, and uh, Lord, I just pray you'd help us to take it to heart and realize how valuable it is, and and Lord, help us to examine our own hearts, whether or not we really believe what we do and, and, and that we're uh, fully persuaded and, and have conviction about it. And uh, help us to, by your power, stand in these last days of apostasy. And so, Father, I pray you will help us now as we continue on, as we sing, and as we hear another message. May you be glorified. May the saints be edified. We depend on you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.
Yeah, I, I'm I'm very very excited to be here with y'all, and uh, this is everything. Just been a blessing. I, I couldn't hardly sleep last night. Uh, I, I may have got to, got to sleep about two o'clock. So uh, we just brother Brett and I we've been learning a lot, and uh, I, I'm just thankful to be around other Bible believers, and uh, this right division and and everything has just been a help to me, but it's it's been a help to my family and our church family. And so I, I thank the Lord that there's so many people out here. I mean, this is exciting to us. Uh, not only I'm, I'm hoping we're going to enjoy the rest of our stay here, but I'm, I'm hoping we can carry the spirit of this back and uh, just just be a help and a blessing to other people. And so uh, before I get to talking too much, I, I get to preaching before I get to preaching, but uh, I, I want to read a few verses to you out of Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And j- just tonight... Uh, I want to give you just a little bit of, of my, my background, maybe, and some verses, of course, along with it, but um, in, in, in a word of testimony. So um, I'm going to read a few, a few verses to you out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm just going to begin the reading in verse number 1. Uh, sounds like just, just about everyone's there. Uh, it says in verse number one, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. And so I want to stop right there and then maybe build my testimony out of a couple of these verses here. Let's pray if you don't mind. Heavenly Father, uh, it sure is a blessing to be here as always. Um, Lord, it's just a joy to be around other uh, Bible believers, Lord. And uh, Lord, just uh, already the time that we've had here has been wonderful, the preaching, the singing, the fellowship. And I just pray, Lord, you'd help uh, your people with your word, Lord. And maybe something to be said here that would be a help, Lord, of others that's listening. And uh, Lord, as always, your word be magnified and you be high and lifted up, Lord. And we need your help, Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, in, in these verses, by way of uh, introduction, the Apostle Paul is writing to correct false teaching on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what he's doing basically is he's just teaching these believers that they're not going through uh, the second advent. He's, he's given a delineation here between the rapture. We're, gonna, we're going up in the rapture of the body of Christ. And he's teaching them, that you're not going through uh, the, the time of tribulation. And so that's a blessing to me to know this. And, and, and so uh, and by way of, of my uh, testimony, I, I thought about reading this text, and I, I remember reading verses like this when I first got saved. And, and <laughs> <laughs> I'm already... <laughs> and so uh, I, I first got saved. I'm trying to hold myself here, see. Uh, but man, hey, it's exciting to know the Lord. It's not boring to me. Being saved is a great thing, but believing the Bible is, is, is a great thing. It's, it's not something trivial. This is a blessing to know what we know. I'm excited about this. It. Look, serving the Lord Jesus Christ has never been boring. It's just getting better and better as we go along. And so I remember getting saved and, and uh, reading a verse like this, and it's so many years of being saved to where I understood it, and it's because of right division to understand things like this. And so, you know, I would, I would be talking to somebody. I got, so let me just start off from, from the start. So uh, I was going to a Baptist church, and what's so strange is my shop, I, I, for a living, I uh, refurbish aluminum. And my polish shop is straight across the road from the church where I trusted Jesus Christ in. And so I was, I was going to that church as a child. Mom and dad always took me to church. And uh, this white-haired preacher, uh, Brother Roy Bostick was his name. And he was a very large feller, a fellow. And I would sit about midways of that uh, church. And he had his hair slicked back. And he would, you know, and slick that hair back, you know. And, he'd, and he would stand back and he'd rear up, you know, and get to preaching. And I just slink down to my seat, you know. And man, he commenced to preaching. And he was up there and he'd say, and he'd hit that pulpit. And, and if you weren't used to it, it'd scare you to death. I mean, first he'd start it off, you know. And everybody get your Bibles out. And, and, and he'd start just getting up there, you know. And before long, he's, and you're going to go to hell. And I, oh, man. 
And, and, but, but he was preaching, if nothing else, he was preaching the gospel, the grace of God. And, and he would get up there and he would say, Christ died. And I'm looking, and he said he was buried, and he rose again the third day. Do you trust that? And that alone. And I'm, he's hammering it in, you know. And I'm thinking, man, I'm not saved. And, and this is what, I'm claustrophobic, and even to this day, I'm claustrophobic. Look, don't put me in no elevator and not let me out. I'm going to make a new door. <laughs> and, and, and brethren, I'm going to tell you something. I was sitting there thinking, Man, this is scary because he said, and it's just like I'm sitting over here, he's pointing at me, and I'm, you know, I'm not pointing at y'all if y'all are there, but that's about where I, and he's pointing at me, and he's saying, you, he said, if you die without Christ, and I'm thinking, he's pointing right at me, is, does, is he pointing me out? <laughs> and he said, you'll go to hell and you'll never get out. And y'all, I'll tell you something, that, that day, I remember where I was sitting at, and I said, I need to trust this gospel right here. I need to trust the gospel, that alone. And, he, and, and what I liked about it was he at least made sure he said, there's nothing you can do for yourself. The Lord Jesus Christ has to do all the saving. And that day I placed my faith and trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for my atonement. And, and y'all, I, I take that Bible... And I had, my mama had got me a little King James Bible, and she said, you better believe that Bible. Every, you believe that Bible? I believe that Bible. You believe every word? I believe every word. <laughs> I believe it. It's Bible. And you know what? It's amazing how when you get uh, excited about things of God, how people, you believe every word of it? Who's told you that? Well, mama did. Well, you think mama's right? Mama's right. You're wrong. <laughs> it's amazing how, where were these people before I got saved? After you get saved, then they start questioning you and stuff. You know, and I tell my brothers, I, I remember too. I get saved, I saved, and, and I, they they go outside, and before they trusted Christ, I say, you know, if y'all die, y'all gonna go to hell, don't you? And you know, they be go. I said, where y'all going tonight? It's none of your business. Well, if you know you die without Christ, you're going to hell, you know. And and man, I was just all excited about it. Which is, you know, of course, that zeal. You know, you want to see people get saved. I'd see people at the gas station stuff. You know, I'm saved. Okay, well that's good, young man. You know, and I said, why are you saved? Well, it's none of your business. Well, I know, but I just want to know if you're saved. You know, you just got that zeal. And, and it, it's amazing how years go on. And what would happen was I, I, I got saved in that church, and that man would, was preaching those sermons like, you know, he'd take a text and take a fit, you know. And, and he'd, take that, he'd take that text, you know, and he'd say, and the Lord Jesus Christ, they, stole, they threw a stone at the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a stone's cast away. How far are you away from so-and-so? Point number one, you're far away in your church fellowship. You're far away in your tithing. I was like, what was that got to do with anything? And you're far away. Just, and, 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 you never, and that's how people are ever learning, never able to come to knowledge of the truth. You're sitting there and you're listing these verses. And like tonight, we got all these verses. Man, what a blessing. I mean, if you like that stuff, you're like, man, ain't this good. But, but if you don't like that stuff, I've had, I, I preached meetings before, and somebody come to the back door and said, sure, what a lot of verses. <laughs> well, well, I mean, that's, it's the Word of God. <laughs> well, what are you going to do? We're going to preach the book is what we're going to do. So what would happen is along the way, I saved, and then getting on up in teenage years and things, and, you know, I, I wasn't studying my Bible, and I wasn't, being taught anything other than just little, quick little, I guess, devotionals, you know, at church. So I wasn't learning. And then people would question me, and I couldn't answer the questions. And some of the same things that was, was going on way back, in, way back here in this Bible is going on today with somebody else, maybe one of y'all, but there's people all of that need help. And rightly dividing the word of truth. Believe in the Bible, but rightly dividing the word of truth so they can handle some of these questions. The only way to answer the questions is through rightly dividing the word of truth. Truth from this dispensation, from truth from our current dispensation. Otherwise, you, look, I don't care who you are. If you don't believe the book rightly divided, you can believe the book all you want to, but there's going to be things in there that seem to contradict. But the difference is in the dispensations. So now, then you start talking to people, you know, and you invite them to church. And, you know, nowadays, you know, they got all these uh, cell phones. And I, I've got one, but I can't operate the thing. I know how to turn. Uh, I'm not real smart on stuff like that. So I know how to turn uh, my, drop my hotel card. I better get that. Uh, but I know how to turn on Alexander Scorby, and I know how to pull up my brother David's sermon. But as far as that, I don't know technologies. 
So these people, they, they're looking things up on the Internet, and I don't know how to follow this stuff along today. And so you say, well, uh, just like talk to you about the Bible. Did you know Morgan Freeman's really Jimi Hendrix? What? <laughs> What's that got to do with anything? Well, evidently they're looking this stuff up, you know. And, and it's like that woman over in John chapter 4, you know, she just keeps changing the subject on you. And you invite somebody to church, you're like, hey, we got a Bible-believing church where we're rightly dividing the word of truth. And somebody says, yeah, it's a long drive. Well, you know, how far you drive to work? About, I don't know, an hour? Well, it's about 40 minutes from our house to your, you know, from our, your house to our church. You could come to our church. Well, I don't know. You know, I heard that Elvis Presley is really alive, and he's preaching up in Tennessee. <laughs> we might go up there and give him a try. <laughs> I'm thinking, what? This is the kind of stuff that people... So we're dealing with some people just don't care. But I want you to know that the people here in this room prove that there are people out there who do care about the truth. And that's what gets me excited. I know there's all kind of conspiracy theories out there. But you know what I'm concerned with? The Bible, the Word of God, that's what's helping people. How do you answer the hard questions? But the thing is, you need to understand according to this, these verses that I'm giving you right here, what I like, and I think uh, uh, Brother David may have said this one time, but according to verse 2, right doctrine should cause you to have a sound mind. That's, that's, uh, I think it's 2 Thessalonians 1, 7. Not a shaken mind. As it's saying here, you shouldn't be shaking a mind. You should have a, a sound mind. Uh, Ephesians 4.23 says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The battle is in your mind. That's why you have to read so much. You talk to some, I'm not kidding you, man. I, I like to talk to people and ask them questions, you know. Well, have you ever read the Bible? Well, I never had read the whole Bible through. You, you think you're supposed to read the whole thing through? Yes. It's, yeah, just read it start to finish like, like any other book. Well, you know, I like to read Psalms, son. And, you know, sometimes I read uh, Romans. So we like Romans 3, you know. That's good. Yeah, but that's why you're confused because you're reading Psalms and you're reading Romans and you're not reading the whole thing through. So you don't see the difference. You don't even know there's problems in there. See, that's the thing. So the first thing I want you to see is to, to eliminate confusion, first of all, See, here's these believers, they were enduring sound doctrine because there's going to come a time when people want to endure sound doctrine. But they were confused about the wrong thing. He, you know, they're confused with this gathering spoken of in Matthew 24, 13. And that's not our gathering. We're going to be gathered together with them the clouds, meet the, the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, that, that's, our, that's a blessed hope. That's wonderful to know that. But there are people who need... Not only to be saved, but to come to the knowledge of the truth. But you're not going to do that unless you make sure you read. And I found out as I got saved and I started re actually reading my Bible through. That's one thing that helped me so much. I started seeing, okay, here's a, here's a gathering here spoken of in Matthew 24. And then 2 Thessalonians says, here's a gathering here. So what's going on? Well, you talk to the, your average preacher. and I'm just going to be honest with you. Most of them don't read their Bibles either. So you talk to them about these verses, and you say, oh, oh well, it, you know, it's not no big deal, you know. Well, obviously it's a big deal, because Matthew 24 is different doctrine than 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And look, I, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I can read plain English, and I know there's a difference there. So as I got saved, I'd come up and I'd start asking preachers questions, and one thing that drove me to start studying more was I would ask them, and I knew I wanted to be a better witness. And I wanted to deal with people on the street, deal with people at work and stuff like that. And if you don't study it yourself, you're not going to be able to answer the questions. You've got to take the time and you're going to have to read. And then whenever you take a, a book that you like, you're going to have to take that book and set your Bible down beside the book and say, okay, this man says this is what this text is saying. What does the Bible say? And I know that sounds simple, but I'm, that's how I messed up over the years. I get these books, and I, I say, oh, man, here's a Bible believer right here. And, well, he believed the book pretty good bit, but then whenever he don't like something, he'd go to the Greek, you know. He don't read Greek. He don't understand Greek. I, I, found, I have found that out. I was telling Brother Brett, one, one guy, he was always talking about the Greek, the Greek, the Greek. So I bought me, I went online and bought me a Texas Receptus. 
And this man, I, I, I said, next time he says something about that Greek, I'm going to give him this thing right here and say, translate for me something I pick, not something you've already previously studied. I hand him that thing, he's turned that thing up, he's like, I said, man, you don't even know what you're talking about. Now, and, see, and it started to dawn on me. You, you know what people aren't doing? People aren't reading the Bible. See, is, it, is it that simple, Brother Chase? People are getting saved, and I believe there's a lot of saved people out there. They get saved, they just simply do not read it for themselves. And that's why they don't see right division, the, because they're not reading the Bible. You know, you get, you get some of these people, and they get saved, and they, uh, okay, well, I think I'm just going to start off in Matthew. Don't start off in Matthew. Romans is a good start. Start off with your apostle. Doctrine is directly to you, and get established in the faith first. That's what I'm saying. That's what I did not do. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I hope that other people will do that so you don't have to do some of the same things I did. And, and just for sake of time, you're talking about getting frustrated. Well, if you're trying to study and you're coming to people who you trust, who you think that, hey, this person really cares and this person wants to see me grow in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you ask them questions and they brush you off. That is, and, and I'll tell you, I went through a time in college by the time I got to college, I was, uh, as my friend says, frustrated. <laughs> I wasn't frustrated. I was frustrated. And, and y'all, I got to the place where I wasn't going to church and stuff. Cause I said, we're a bunch of liars. This, guy, this man says he believes the Bible, and he stands up here, and where he don't like it, he'll correct it. And this man believes, says there's no contradictions, and he's up here preaching uh, James chapter 2, and then he's preaching Romans chapter 4 and making out like it's the same thing. That man's a liar, and I got frustrated. So then one day, my, my friend, he invited me to church. I said, I'm not going to church. I said, I'm going down here to the gym, and I'm going to pump some weights. And that's just what I thought. And so I used to, which be, I used to be a personal trainer, and I love working out, man. But I just said, I'm not going to that church. Well, then I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take out my Bible, and I'm going to read me a few to soothe my conscience, you know. And I'm not kidding you, that word, that, that, that King James Bible is a lie. It is a lie. I, I started reading over there and it said, for bodily exercise, profit little. <laughs> but godliness is profit unto all things. And I thought, man, hey, but I did say, it does profit little. <laughs> so it is, so I did, that at least helped me out. But I'm just saying, as much as I enjoy exercising, godliness is more profitable. And, and there's something about little things like that started happening. I started realizing the Word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I, I realize, just like y'all have heard it preached incorrectly, the Word of God is reading you. You think you're reading it, it's reading you. And that thing is a lot, and, and it started, little things like that started happening. And, and, and just like I, I had one Bible, I had an NIV that I read in my pickup truck, and a King James that I read at the house. And somebody gave me an NIV, and I said, I don't know about this thing anyway. So I was reading it on my lunch break, and one day I read something, and I said, uh, what, what just happened right here? So I read, and I noticed that a complete number in the verse was missing. I said, hold on just a minute. I was reading over in Luke, if I recall correctly, and it went from like verse uh, 45 to verse 47, somewhere along in there. <laughs> I said, what? Is this trash? They left, and, and see, I'm just, I'm probably like y'all. If you like your, if you like the Bible, you, they left something out. Now they're like, what else they left out? So then that got me studying the Bible issue more. And the more I studied the Bible issue, then I started reading for myself. And then not only did I make sure to read, but make sure you believe what you read. He said, uh, the day of Christ. Right here, he said, well, the day of, of Christ is at hand. You know what I had to start doing for my own self? I had to go through there and say, okay, I'm going to have to study this out. Because at the time, I, had no, I didn't know any material to get or anything. I started studying the thing. Out, and and I, I still I had to write email right over here in my margin. More light, Lord, I need some more light on this thing. And it was a long time. But still, I was reading, I was reading, I was reading. And I realized, not only make sure you read, make sure you believe what you read. And once I started believing that the King James Bible is the Word of God, it's alive. That changes everything. Once you believe this book right here, I'm going to tell you something. Once you believe that Bible right there, it changes you. 
It changes you on the inside. You get an excitement about you, about studying. You realize, you realize I'm reading this Bible, but this is God's words. People always want to talk about all this stuff. They say, we've seen this UFO. We see all this stuff from the other side and everything else. I'm thinking, Here, here's something from the other side that's real that I can see. It's, it literally did come from the other side, and I can read this thing. And all they're talking about is things that, look, if you want to see flying saucers, make your wife mad. You see some flying saucers. <laughs> I'm just saying, this is real in my life. And it puts an excitement in my heart. And, and so I started making sure I believe what I read. All right, and then, not only that, but I want you to know the Bible is relevant and you'll have some of the same troubles they had. He said, uh, there's things that trouble them that's going to trouble us. He said, by spirit. So you're going to have false doctrines. 1 Timothy 4.1 talks about uh, false doctrines being preached today. And it's men that are backed by another spirit. So I started running into these false doctrines. So then... You get this hunger for the Word of God. And y'all know what it's like. If you, once you get that hunger, man, it's just the only the Word of God can feel that. And that's like earlier. Listen to all those verses. That's feeding your inner man, and you're getting excited. Okay, so I go to revival, and this man stands up, and he takes a verse, and he takes a fit, you know, and he's getting up there and spitting all over the place and everything and not really saying a whole lot. He's saying a whole lot without saying anything at all, you know. And I'm saying, maybe it's something. Maybe something's going to come up. So by, at the end of the service, he gets up and he says, I'll tell you what. And he gets up on that pulpit. He said, after a message like that, and I'm thinking, I don't know about that. And he said, y'all ought to be crawling down to this altar. <laughs> I'm looking, I, I like, I'm looking around. And I said, there's a couple people in wheelchairs. <laughs> <laughs> this man over here got COPD. <laughs> and this lady over here, she coughing the whole time. I said, this man's saying. And you know what happens? You start to, re- you start to sit back and realize, there's got to be some believers out there somewhere that enjoy the Lord, but, they ha- but have a balance, that have some sense about some things. That's not putting things on people that they can't handle. There, there is really people out there with sound, same mind that love the Lord and love the Word and believe it like it's written to who it's written to. You don't change anything. You just believe, hey, this was written to this group of believers, and I believe, okay, Hebrews chapter 6, guess what? You talk to people and they will strip a gear once they learn. I believe it just like it's written to who it's written to. But another spirit will come in and they'll start telling you all this stuff. So you get, you get up there and you start talking to some of these guys and you say, you know, I, I really don't believe the Bible teaches that way. Who you been listening to? What, what's it matter? I, I can't find it in the Bible. What's it matter who I've been listening to? If I can't find it in the Bible, I have a, an ability to be able to question what you're saying. You get this mentality where some men don't be question, don't want to be questioned. Yo, it don't matter what this preacher or any other preacher says. The Bible is right and the preacher is wrong where he goes against the Word of God rightly divided. It's, it's just that, but that's so simple, people stumble over it. But it's the same thing. And that's as I went along... Spirits, that you got trouble there. You got the word of God, or, or the word, I'm sorry. Uh, it says, nor by spirit. It says, by spirit, nor by uh, word. So what happened is I start to check things. And I tell you, this is, this is where you really start getting into, so he was talking about buy the truth and sell it not. This is where you really start getting the rubber meeting the road. You start checking those sayings. You start checking sayings like, well, water baptism is outward, outward show of an inward work of grace. I've heard that since I was a child, but then you go check that with the Word of God. And you start thinking, okay, a lot of these phrases aren't in the Bible. Well, then you check the Word of God, what the Word of God actually says, and then you go back and you start trying to tell others about it, and you find out they're, well, they're, they're your friends as long as everything's going well. But it's like the little boys, they're riding down, the, they, they got them a little cart made, and they're going down the hill, and it looks like it's a wonderful ride, you know. But they, they don't realize there's a briar patch at the bottom of that hill. And so the boy he, who invented the ride, he's going out there, and everybody's bailing off as they're seeing the briar, briar patch, and the only the one boy that's directly behind him, he didn't see it, you know, and he stays on. And they go through the briar patch, and the, and the boy in the front says, he said, you find out who your friends are whenever you hit the briar patch. When you start getting to this place by the word or by letter S from us, you start to see how false doctrines are, they get started by inventing phrases by the wisdom of men that do not match the Bible. 
they get talking about these tongues, and that's initial evidence of filling with the Holy Ghost, you know what you're going to start doing? You're going to get to the place where when you hear a man who, look, a lot of them are sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. They'll say something, and they've heard this saying so many times, it becomes part of their language, and it becomes part of, they get to the place where they can stand behind the pulpit and preach without thinking, and they say this thing, and it does not match the Bible. And if you're going to really be a Bible believer, you're going to not only believe that the King James Bible is the Word of God, but actually actively use it in your daily life and check things that come to you from the world and the wisdom of men, and you're going to check it and say, okay, does it line up? With the word of God. I'm, I'm supposed to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. And if it's not good, I don't have to hold on to it. And it's not good if it doesn't match the Bible. And I'll tell you something. I'll just be honest, to you, honest with you. Some of these guys, they say, well, he's a good preacher. Well, yeah, good words and fair speeches deceive. In Romans 16, verse 18, I believe it is. It's a lot of good, and look, they can preach me under the top. I'll just be honest with you. Some of these guys can, but I'm telling you, they're doing that take a verse, take a fit thing, and you're not learning anything. They're coming to church, and you know what it does? It makes church so simple because nobody gets under conviction or anything. Well, I know about what he's going to say. I know he's going to say something about church attendance. I know he's going to say something about tithing, and uh, make sure you live right and you spit white. That, that is, you don't chew backer. <laughs> you know where we're at. As long as you do that now, you're good with that, you're good with that. But never mind learning what the Bible says. And you know what happens? The joy that we have here in this room that comes from believing the Bible correctly, because you're checking, that's where the joy is, is living by the Word of God. And then you get that thing where by letter. Now, we don't have false Pauline epistles going around today like they did, but you know what you have? A lot of men put more stock in the writings of other men than they do the Bible itself. Yeah. There are people who, and I, I don't have to mention all the sets of commentaries. I think, I think the, the Lord that we got some Bible-believing commentaries out there, but he'll even tell you, check his commentaries with the Bible. There are some people, I know men today, who've got, they got a shelf full of commentary, and if you say something about right division that goes beyond what they think, they'll say, well, so-and-so says in his commentary, I don't care what he says in his commentary, if it goes against the Word of God, the Word of God is the final authority. Yeah. It's just that simple. Yeah. Well, some, well, I just don't know. I, I don't know about you. <laughs> Why? Because I'm, I'm learning. I'm trusting the Word of God over anything. So then years go on, and I run into different right division things over the years and start growing a little bit at a, at a time. And uh, one thing that got me uh, <laughs> uh, listening to uh, Brother David was, and I didn't even realize who he was a long time ago, but I had a beard, and so you got these legalizers. And, man, I'm not kidding you. I can show you a picture. I had a beard. I can grow a thick beard, man. It was down here. And man, I walk that thing. I had it just right, man. I I wear a big old I wear a big old right wide brim hat. And people say you Amish now, midnight. And uh, <laughs> man, I I'd be working around the yard, go downtown, I have my shorts on with those shoes, you know, and I had the shorts on, short sleeve shirts, you know, I'd go around that big old and I'd make sure it was combed out good, you know. And uh, people say now, uh, do y'all shoe horses where you at? <laughs> no, no, I just got a big beard. And so anyway, I had these, I, I, I go to, I went to this meeting one time, and man, I mean, they just stripped every gear they had. I, I was about to uh, preach, and they said, well, this guy's going to preach. I could hear him, you know, over there. They, they, they thought I couldn't hear him, but I can hear And they said, uh, this guy's going to preach. he got a big old beard. I can't believe he's here. What's he going to do? <laughs> like, like I'm going to do something crazy. So anyway, I started studying the thing about beards, and I looked up, and, and Brother David had a message on, and, and I looked at this. I've been looking all over for it. <laughs> and Genesis 41, verse uh, number 14, it talks about them Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. He shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in on the Pharaoh. And this is what I got written from 2019. I got it right here to prove it. I got uh, uh, Brother David Osteen said <laughs> A shaven face signifies submission to a man. Now, now I'm sure, now look, now look, I'm sure that's out of context. I'm not trying to put it, but I'm just saying, it's a, it's a strange thing how you, 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 and even something like that, and I, I started listening, I, I thought, well, you know what, you know, I, and I know it's probably taken, because he had it in the right way, I'm, 
But I'm just saying, <laughs> that's funny. But, you know, I got, and I started to realize, there's people out there who believe the book, because I got to listen to some of the message. I said, well, this man believes the Bible. I said, not only that, he's rightly dividing. So what's the big deal here? So I knew, I said, well, there's obviously people out there who, who believe the book who are not going to get mad at you for having a beard. That, that's just too, you see what I'm saying? You can, you can overcorrect. And so what I'm saying is what you have here is very special because you got to believe the Bible, but you got to rightly divide your Bible. But then at the same time, don't go too far to the left with it and don't go too far to the right with it. Buy the truth and sell it not like you said. Be glad that you have the truth, but realize there are other people out there who have just not arrived yet and give them some grace like you had grace and give them time to learn. Well, because you never know who you're going to be able to help. See, I, I got in this thing by, by you know, talks about, you know, by letter. And, and there, there are people who put writings of men above the Bible. Nothing in your life should ever be above your King James Bible. And I don't care if it's scrolling through your Facebook or whatever. Some of you can check that thing and say, man, four and a half hours, uh, you know, average a day, you know, this past week because there's different people. Well, what if you took that time and read your Bible with it? How much Bible would people know if they even took a fraction of their, their time and you know what's happening? You gotta you gotta believe a book, but from reading it, reading it will cause you to believe it. You gotta believe it rightly divided. You gotta fellowship with other people that love the Lord and love His book. But at the same time, let that doctrine feed your inner man, grow your inner man, and live it out. Because in Second Thessalonians, with all these things going on, I want you to look at uh, chapter three with me in closing. I want you to see something so simple. Because I'm telling you something. There's a simplicity in Christ that the world is missing. The, the world's gotten so complicated and so mixed up with all the things coming in, they have forgotten the blessing of not only being saved, not only knowing your Bible, not only knowing it rightly divided, but you get to apply the Word to your life daily and let it work in and through you. And you know what it does? Instead of being concerned about all these things, you think he, he would go into great detail about all these power, signs and line wonders and all this stuff. Everybody all wants to know, when's the end of the world going to be? And when, who's the Antichrist? And the Antichrist Christ, you know, one time it was Henry Kissinger, and then it was Obama, and then it was uh, Emmanuel Macron. They don't know. They don't know. They're guessing. So instead of, instead of predicting all that stuff, it's what he says. We're talking about the Word of God. He says, finally, brethren, just this simple. Pray for us that the Word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. That's putting the Word of God on such a pedestal. He's saying the Word of God will be glorified. When the Lord says He don't share His glory, a country version, he, don't share, he doesn't share His glory with anyone, but it says the Word of God be glorified. What? Even as it is with you. Right now, the, Lord, the Word of the Lord being glorified right here in this room, well, you're supposed to be putting it above anything and everything else. You say, uh, what, what, what do you think that means where it says magnify? Well, I, I'm, I'm pretty country on this thing, but I know back when we used to get a magnifying glass, we'd look at it, and, and everything else that was underneath that magnifying glass was bigger than everything else around it. You magnify the Word of God, the Word of God should be larger than anything else around that you have. And, and watch what he says. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable wicked men, for all men have not faith. Where's faith come? The Word of God. Faith come by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. What's wrong with it? They're just not hearing the Word of God. It says, but the Lord is faithful. You know why your faith comes from? The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is faithful. It says, who shall establish you and keep you from evil? Why? Because we're going completely against the course of this world, this present evil world, and you know what we're doing? We're trying to believe the book, believe it right, the divide, and apply it in our life, and it's going to keep us from evil because the Lord's faithful, and if you're letting the word, the word of the Lord work in and through you, you know what it's going to do? As He works in and through you, He's going to keep you from this present evil world, from not only, because look, we, we know, like Brother David said, you've got so much evil in this world, the only way to escape it is, is leave it. But the only way to be in the world, not of the world, is let this right here happen in your life. And it says, and we have confidence in the Lord. Not, not in you. He says, touching in the Lord, touching you, that you both do 
and will do. You're going to do it because you want to. We out of your own free will. It says the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. And in the patient waiting for Christ. Well, you, know why, you know why people aren't patiently waiting? Because they have stopped doing these simple things right here. Just believing the word. Believing it rightly divided. And doing what he says right here. Letting the Lord work in and through you. By your own free will. You yielding to the word of God daily. And that daily word working in your heart and life. And you know how you help other people? Just like y'all been a blessing to us already in this meeting. By letting the word of God have free course and you need to be glorified. And taking your time. It's very humbling that I know y'all have taken y'all's time out. From wherever you come from and came and sat down here and listened to Bible preaching and teaching for a few hours here. That's a blessing. But you know it don't need to stop here. We need to carry this on out of here. And try to help others just as you've been helped. I hope that was a help to you. Let's stop there. Brother David. All right, that was great. I'm going to finish my message. You got me all worked up. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Brother Chase, you know, he's already starting to get a little bit of opposition. And that's what happens, you know. Not everybody. Look, thank God for the people who want the truth. And that's the people who are going to see it. They want to see it. They're looking for the truth. But then you find there are people, when you get excited about what you're seeing, you start trying to share it with people that might even claim to really love the Word of God, but then they start getting angry when you're challenging the traditions they're holding to. But if what you believe is so, you ought to be able to take it to the Word of God and prove it. Paul said, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. And so I know uh, we've talked, and, you know, look, I'm, it's for me, I've gone through some things, but nothing like what Paul went through, so I've got nothing to complain about. But you start getting a little opposition, and uh, you know, but that's part of it. And uh, but you <laughs> follow it through, and uh, you know, he touched on it, and I said something about it. I want to emphasize as we learn, it's not only for our own benefit, but also to minister to others, because there's people out there wanting answers. They're confused. They're discouraged. They're hurting. And the most compassionate thing you can do for people is share the word of God. Because that's the answers they need. It's in the Word and share the truth of the Word. And I talked to a guy, just for one example, I talked to a guy that uh, his wife had died. And, and, I, and I'll never forget what he said. He was so bitter with God. And he said, I'm, I, he said I know I'm saved. He said, I'm never praying again. I'm never praying again. So why do you say that? He said, because I asked God to heal my wife, and I believe with all my heart, and he didn't. I said, well... The problem's not with God. It's somebody has taught you wrong about some promises, uh, you know, about if you believe uh, whatsoever things you ask, you shall have them. And I, and I said, can I just share with you what that what that's about in its context and, and, and then try to talk? To, and so I was able to minister some things from the scriptures about prayer that really helped him. But, I mean, that's, you think about the, the seriousness of that. Here's a man who's so bitter and he's, he doesn't even want to pray anymore because he's been taught wrong about the thing. God never said he would give you whatever you ask just because you believe, just because you named it, you know. That, that, there's some promises that have a certain context to it. And I think our promises, by the way, are even better because uh, he gives us a peace that passeth all understanding, you know. And uh, he can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And, and just this issue of trusting the Lord. But, you know, again, it's a, it's a wonderful blessing, and, and we're so privileged uh, to have this opportunity, but we want to share it with others. We want to minister it to others. And, and so I hope you've been encouraged tonight to, you know, just like I say, you're here because you believe the Bible, but, man, it's just a, the issue of personally, really, uh, between you and God. And we're glad we can help you, but we want, it's got to be between you and the Lord first and foremost as far as that, that matter of, of getting in the book for yourself and being nourished up in it. And uh, tomorrow, <clears throat> we'll, uh, I hope you can come, uh, you know, the breakfast at the hotel probably ain't going to be very good. Um, <laughs> no, it's probably all right. But if you come here at 8 o'clock, we have um, the kitchens in here, and we'll have some stuff in here. We have an outdoor eating uh, area now that we just finished up recently. Plenty of room and plenty of food at 8 o'clock, and then time to talk and whatever. And then... Um, We'll come in here at 9, and Brother Eric, who's been a great blessing. I'll talk more about him tomorrow, but he's been in our church now since early this year. Been a big help to us. He's going to speak first, but he's going to sing. And looking forward to that, because I know what he's going to sing. He's still going to sing that. 
I, I like that song, and so it'll be, it'll be good. And then we'll have uh, Brother uh, um, Chase is going to speak again in the morning, and then Stephen Carter. Uh, of course, he's been, you've been here a number of times. He needs no introduction, but uh, we'll, uh, he, they, they're in West Virginia, so that's quite a drive. Uh, he'll be preaching tomorrow, and then uh, Drew Elrod's coming in tomorrow. He couldn't make it tonight, but he'll be here tomorrow. He's been here before as well. He's in Calhoun, Georgia. So um, those are the speakers, and then um, and then Sunday, Drew and I will finish up. So uh, uh, anyhow, that's so tomorrow. So from nine to lunchtime, and then we'll eat here, and then come back tomorrow night at six thirty, and have two more preachers, and then uh, Sunday morning at nine, we're having breakfast again, and then two more services at ten and eleven. Has anybody got any questions or anything? Or everything all right? <laughs> um, don't go down into the streets of Jackson tonight. You won't be safe. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it's all right. We're just a small town for the most part. But uh, I'm trying to think. It seems like, I for, what am I, honey, what am I forgetting? I'm always, I'm getting like Joe Biden, man. I can't, I'm like, I need a teleprompter, man. What's the, what's the thing? What's the, you know the thing. No joke, no joke. Um, what am I forgetting? There's no, all right, that's the thing. All right, wrap it up. That's it. Well, I, I appreciate y'all coming. I really do. Looking forward. I hope you'll be back uh, in the morning, and we'll get started again. And so, let's stand, if you would, please. Um, all right, we'll dismiss with a word of prayer. And look forward to seeing y'all in the morning. And uh, close out here and ask uh, brother. Erwin, would you close us in prayer tonight, sir? Amen. Amen. See you in the morning. Hope you sleep good.